Welcome back to the Automation Podcast. My name is Sean Tierney, and this week on the show, I meet back up with RC from PNF to learn all about LiDAR technology, products, and applications. RC, thank you for coming back on the Automation Podcast. It's great to have you back on the show, and I'm really looking forward to learning about LiDAR. But before we jump into that, could you reintroduce yourself to our audience in case some of the uh, listeners and viewers have not uh, seen one of our previous episodes? Well, first, thank you for having me back. So uh, very briefly, for those who who haven't uh, seen or heard of me before, my name is RC Crosby. I'm an industrial automation generalist, a functional safeguarding specialist, and uh, for PNF, I'm a content evangelist, which basically means I do stuff like this, uh, write articles and uh, do conferences and stuff. For those who have never heard of a Pepperell or a Fook before, um, we started in 1945. We're a, a global industrial automation company. We're still family owned with 6,000 employees globally, we have over 50,000 products in the in the portfolio. Uh, a couple of highlights on us. We invented the inductive proximity sensor as well as the intrinsically safe circuit. Uh, we've been here in the Western Hemisphere since 1980, and we divide ourselves up into two major groups. Uh, one, the factory automation group, which is who I work for, and also the process automation group, who does more uh, purge and pressurization uh explosion proof hmis and uh hazardous rated uh mobile devices like cell phone and tablets real quick we have a general portfolio that consists of a wide variety of vision sensing identifying and positioning devices we also have a, a portfolio of network communication products things like managed and unmanaged network switches serial gateways ethernet modules edge gateways and since I'm the safety guy, I have to talk about our functional safeguarding portfolio. Um, over 700, 700 products that have SIL ratings or performance level ratings, uh, light curtains, safety switches, and the world's only safe ultrasonic sensor. So that brings me to today's topic, uh, LiDAR specifically, but featuring what we call the R2000 family which is that scanner you see kind of in that middle left of the screen there. And I know that's a little bit different than what your audience is used to hearing. Um, you know, it's a little bit uh, out of the usual automation realm, but I think LiDAR is an integral part of another way of addressing IOT or automation, and that's going autonomous. You know, we, we talk about, autonomous guided vehicles, cobots, you know, robots now that have multi degree of freedom, but now are on a, a platform that can be deployed or redeployed. So I just think it's a, a really interesting way. It's another way to address the industry 4.0 topic. Specifically this sensor that, that we have here, it's, it's a 360 degree sensor with what we call pulse ranging technology, uh, PRT, which is really a time of flight device. For those who have never heard of a LIDAR before, LIDAR stands for light dynamics and ranging. The backbone of this technology is time of flight or our PRT technology, which you have this industrial hardened high intensity light pulse that is sent out and reflected back to the receiver from an object. And we measure that time that that, that pulse, that short pulse is in field. And that's how we, we get the distance calculation. You can kind of see that with the little bit of a graph on that upper right hand section of the screen. Um, and, and then a very basic breakdown of the formula there in the dead center of the screen on how we, how we calculate that time of flight. Now, just for the audio only audience, think about light travels about 300 millimeters in one nanosecond. So this thing is precise. This piece of equipment is really precise. Absolutely. You know, in the, in the, the short pulses for our time of flight lets us have a really high signal intensity and also lowers the, uh, the noise immunity for the signal. So that, that's kind of also why we do this, this method gives us 
a lot of accuracy within the technology. We have four major models that we, we sort of talk about within this specific family. And that sort of breaks down into two type of capabilities. One we call a detector model, which you see sort of here at the lower left. And I'll go into these a little bit more deeper here in a, in a few minutes. And we also have the measurement units, which are the, the three units to the, to the right of this scale here. And really it's broken down based on resolution and range that you need for your application. So these would be basically sort of selected per the application, not really a one size fits all kind of thing, but great for everything from object detection, collision avoidance to localization, mapping, navigation, things that you would want within the autonomous spectrum. So like I said before, there is a high, high, high sampling rate for these devices. The lowest level gives you 54,000 measurements a second, up to the very high, high definition model gives you 252 scan points per second. As far as mapping goes and uh, local, localized navigation, that is an absolute ton of data to work from. An absolute great data set to work from. Now you need to know how to use utilize that kind of data set, but it is plenty to work from. Specifically with these models, as you see up in the upper right hand corner of the presentation there, we overlap the beam to make sure that there is 100% coverage within that 360 degree rotation. So if you need to detect a pin, this is a, this is a device that can do that because there's no gaps in the beams. As it's as it's rotating, there are no gaps. So you can slow it down to get a lot of resolution, or you can speed it up, get a little less resolution, but a little, a little bit quicker of a response time from the device as well. So like I said, there's two major detection or, or major models. One is the detection model, which I have up here on the screen right now. And it has an onboard program resident to the device. And we basically call it our output model, right? So it has four outputs available and it's programmed just kind of like you would use uh, a program for another type of scanner. Uh, it uses Pactware. And uh, as you can see on the screen, it's got a little screenshot of, of what you see from the programming software. You would draw a field, assign an output, and then you can do you know, small logic functions that you can see in the sort of lower left-hand portion of the right-hand portion of the screen, that screenshot there. You can see some andoring that you can do with the outputs to, you know, utilize those outputs as, as you see fit. Uh, a lot of people use these for collision avoidance. So you would say maybe output one, which is the closest to the sensor, would be a stop command for the, say, AGV. Whereas maybe zone two would be a warning or a, a slowdown uh, before the stop command in zone one. So just kind of as a collision avoidance um, kind of application or, or suggestion there. I guess unlike a self-driving car, you really wouldn't have to have the AGV try to go around <laughs> any uh, uh, people, right? If somebody walked in the, in the way of the, uh, the vehicle, it would just have to know how close they were. And if they're if they're semi close, they could slow down. And if they're really close, it would stop. And you wouldn't have to actually redirect it or try to get it to drive around them. So I could I could definitely see using this tool and using those uh, those different uh, Boolean choices there to uh, to you know lay out a system like you said. Hey, if it's if it's this close, we got to go slow. If it's this close, we got to stop. Yeah, and and maybe you put so there's four four zones you can draw. So maybe the third zone is maybe an audible warning, like, hey, I see you in my path, move yeah, maybe or, or whatnot, if it is a human and it can move. Uh, if it's a fixed object, that's a that's another sort of thing. But if it is in a, like a cobot and there's a, or, or something like that, where there is foot traffic in the path, you could assign another zone that says, hey, there's somebody there or, or I'm approaching, please move or, or whatnot, you know. Yeah, I can see too. If it's a cobot, then if something's on the right hand side, it maybe not be able to use the right hand side. 
but if the left left hand side is open, it could still go to the left and do things with the left hand side. So I see where you're going with that. That that makes a lot of sense. Sure. And, and some other people use the, the different zones for understanding what's going on. So you could set up four zones and if something passes through zone one, it, it recognizes that or something passes through zone two. Like uh, let's say doing kind of bin fill, you can set up this 2D plane above the bins, draw your zones that correlate to the bins. And then as, you know, say a pick and place robot puts something into the bin, you know that that thing got put into the correct bin. You could do part verification that way or, you know, ejection verification in, in those types of manners. Um, with this type of device. The other sort of uh, flavor we offer with, within the R2000 is the measurement uh, version, which, which is a, a raw data output device. Um, this goes for our standard high and ultra high definition models. Um, it does not have an application stored within the memory. So that is something that the customer or some third party would have to develop some way of taking into that data, taking that data into a PC or a Raspberry Pi or some type of controller and utilizing it that way. It is, it is a, over Ethernet, so it is, you know, a common uh, protocol. And you can see uh, some of those, those types there on the right side of the screen of, of what the tags are that you're going to get from the device. And here is a screenshot of kind of what you actually get from the device. And I'm going to distill all this down into you get three return values from the raw data stream. You get the angle. So where on that 360 degree rotation the sensor is. You get the distance, how far away it measured something. And then you get signal strength or amplitude back, which that in itself, in some instances, can be used to evaluate a target, right? So if you have uh, a step change in that signal strength, you can use that as a detection method, right? So if the, the background has a very low amplitude, then all of a sudden the object, which may not be very thick in width, but very different within signal strength, or, or in this case, it would be really reflectivity, mm -hmm. then you can use that as also a method of detecting whatever objects out there. As far as applications go, there, there are a handful of really, really good applications within the autonomous space or within the, the collision avoidance space. Obviously, with the detector, collision avoidance is, is great. You know, protrusion detection, um, you know, gap detection, so empty storage bay kind of detection. Uh, just, I mean, again, as as you're moving something through uh, your material handling, just making sure that it doesn't get in the way. Um, that's that's one way to do it. I and mean, as you see here, they're detecting that pole, uh, and also detecting. Um, this wire harness hanging off a car, right? And which could get caught up into the next part of the process and rip it out of the car, causing damage to either the machine or, or the vehicle itself. And, and I'm referring to this picture on the left-hand side of the screen. You know, and then you get into some of the raw measurement output models uh, as you have in the middle part of the screen with the, the standard unit and, and the, the high def unit. Um, you can do object perception, mapping, positioning, uh, some basic measurement as well. And then uh, with the ultra high def, as you see on the right hand side, uh, uh, localization, navigation, natural feature navigation, uh, and, and mapping as well, profiling and mapping as well uh, from that ultra high def unit. So those are the traditional applications for the LiDAR and the R2000. However, one of our newer products utilizes the R2000 to do conveyor belt utilization 
figuring and as well as volume uh, measurement of the uh, the parcels or bags on a conveyor belt. So you see from the uh, the picture here, the R2000 is mounted vertically over the conveyor and it is scanning the conveyor across the conveyor. And what that allows you to do is understand two things. One, kind of what that belt utilization is on this 2D plane, on this one slice of plane, you understand what's happening on the belt utilization. And to do that, we've developed an algorithm that factors in the shadow effect. So of course you have this, this LIDAR that is over top of this machine and it's scanning down and it's looking. And of course, as soon as it clips the, the top two corners of the box, now you're gonna have a shadowing effect as you see in this upper left-hand picture from the, the screenshot of the software. You have a shadowing effect that makes it look more, I mean, trapezoidal than, than rectangular than it really is as you see at the bottom of the screen. So when we use this shadow effect correction, that belt utilization goes from a perceived 50% to an actual 22%, which is what's being used. And of course, since that's a 2D moment in time, if you put a distance and a time to that with an encoder, you can do volume calculation as well. So you can X, Y, and Z of a parcel or bag uh, for like a baggage handling situation. Or if you, uh, would rather know the gap between parcels or bags. You can take the inverse of that measurement as well. So this is, is uh, and also you know exactly where the, the parcel is in relation to the belt, right? So you see here, parcel one's kind of just off center and then there's another little guy off to the, to the right there. Um, so you, you kind of know what's where on this thing so you can sort and divert kind of a little bit more cleanly as well. So I talked mostly about the R2000, which is our 360 degree 2D scanner. Um, sort of other sensors with that technology or similar technology in it. Obviously we offer it in a single beam, um, just as, as a distance measuring la uh, either laser or infrared sensor. Um, uses the same time of flight technology, uh, same PRT technology in that. We also have a non-rotating 2D LiDAR sensor. It is in the middle of the screen there and it has no moving parts. So that, that's, that's pretty good. It's eight um, infrared beams spaced 11 degrees apart. Uh, it has two models that you can get with a raw data output, or we also offer it uh, with a can open output. So it would be great for outdoor mobile equipment type uh, applications. Upper right, we have our 3D LiDAR sensor, which um, operates on a very similar principle to, to the sensor we've been discussing this whole time, but uh, it only does 100 degrees in the X axis, but it does give you a plus or minus 10 degrees in the Y axis. So we call that our 3D LiDAR sensor. And the lower left, we have our uh, laser profile sensor, our smart runner, as uh, we call it in the field. Um, and there's two options with that. One is a, a, a profiler, which just takes a, a profile of what it's seeing. And, and reports that that data. And that's really only across about 600 millimeters. So it's not in the same scale as, uh, as the big 2D scanner, but in small localized scale can be do, done to uh, small measurement, small profiling sections. And then we also offer it in a, in a matcher version, which you teach it a contour and then it looks for that contour. It looks for the match. And, you know, so it could be good for QC or um, making sure that 
like say a, a, a robot is is picking up say a, a car door but you want it to grab it in a specific spot well then you would teach it the spot and have it grab there and you would use something like the the matcher to do that then lastly kind of in the lower right hand corner we have our optical data couplers and this uh allows us to wirelessly wirelessly broadcast from point to point an ethernet signal up to 100 mega, megabits per second over 150 meters wow. so um that's great for exchanging data in things like an asrs bay or automated storage and retrieval bay or you know, sending information to a skillet as it's uh, riding around the uh, automotive facility. Um, when you just don't want to put it on Wi-Fi, but need to wirelessly broadcast Ethernet, that's a great option. So here is Nolan's information. Uh, Nolan is our product manager for LiDAR here in the U.S. Um, and there's his phone number and email should you have questions, or you can feel free to reach out to me. My uh, my phone number and email is right there, and uh, I'm happy to talk with you, discuss LiDAR, IoT, you know, all the fun industrial automation buzzwords, fill in blank. I happy, I'm happy to uh, discuss those. Well, we're happy to have you back on the show. I appreciate you running through that. I now know a lot more about this product than I did when you first came on. So really appreciate you coming on the show again, RC, and uh, bringing us through the product line and uh, showing us the applications for this one particular product. So thanks again for coming on. Hey, Sean, as always, thanks for having me. And I look forward to the next time. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. And I want to thank RC for coming back on the show, this time to talk to us all about LiDAR technology. Now, if you did enjoy this episode, please consider giving us a like and a sub. And if you're listening to the audio edition, please consider giving us a five-star review. It really helps us grow the audience and find new vendors to come on the show. Now, if you want to follow me and keep in touch, you can do so over at automation.locals.com. And if you know anybody looking for PLC, HMI, or SCADA training, please send them over to the automationschool.com. With that, I want to wish you all a very happy, safe, and healthy week. And until next time, my friends, peace.